Hello, and today's presentation is Public Opinion and Political Participation. What is public opinion? Public opinion is a combination of the views, attitudes, and ideas held by individuals in a community. There's no single public opinion. There's a wide range of viewpoints. Different people think differently about politics. Political opinions differ in ideological orientation, intensity with which they are held, and sophistication. The level of intensity with which an opinion is held is likely to influence political participation. For example, a person who is vehemently, passionately pro-choice is likely to vote for a pro-choice candidate based mostly or entirely on his or her pro-choice view. A person who leans only slightly pro-choice in his or her opinions is likely to decide how to vote is less likely to decide how to vote based on that pro-choice opinion. Americans are fairly ignorant about politics. A substantial share of the American public does not care much about politics, knows relatively little about it, and does not think about it in very sophisticated terms. Now, public opinion, unsophisticated as it may be, is crucial in most modern societies, especially in democratic ones. Public discontent can give rise to anger and to political instability, including major strikes, riots, and revolutions. Modern politicians simply cannot afford to ignore public opinion. Americans are less cynical than Europeans about their political institutions. Even for institutions that are sometimes singled out as objects of public disdain in the United States, such as mainstream media, sometimes even labor unions and Congress, Americans consistently have more confidence in such institutions than do their Europeans, European counterparts. Now, precision is not always important to politicians in order to take advantage of public opinion for their own purposes. Take Ronald Reagan during his re-election campaign of 1984. Reagan's campaign was characterized by heavy symbolism and was short on substance, short on details. He emphasized equality, freedom, consent of the governed capitalism and the free enterprise system. There's no exact definition of what equality is or even what freedom is, but if you emphasize a few basic uh, words, keywords, a few slogans that the public in general can get behind, uh, even though uh, their meaning is vague, and perhaps that's precisely the reason why so many people can get behind these slogans, if you could utilize those slogans, then uh, you you have a leg up against the competition. And of course, there were other uh, trade winds that favored Reagan. Uh, the economy was good in 1983 in, and 1984. The economy made turnaround very sharply, uh, almost exactly halfway during Reagan's first term. 1981 and 1982 were very difficult years characterized by high unemployment, high inflation, and then we had totally opposite in 1983 and 1984. And so, of course, pocketbook issues were important. But it was also important that Reagan was able to hit exactly those notes in public discourse that uh, actually meshed with, that jibed with uh, the, the public opinion, the public mood. Now, when you do want to measure public opinion more or less precisely, you turn to scientific polling, and scientific polling uses random sampling. Randomness ensures representativeness, okay? Uh, and every poll has a margin of error. Few scientific polls actually have more than 800 respondents, and almost none have more than 1,500. So, as I said, in order to be scientific, polling has to be random. Quota sampling and self-selected sampling does not work. So I probably should backtrack just a little bit and explain 
uh, the difference between the sample and the population. So a sample is a portion of the population whose opinion you want to know. And since time and money are always limited, you uh, most of the time you just do not have uh, the time or the money to interview the entire population whose opinion you want to know. So uh, you have to take a sample. And the probability theory tells us that if you take a random sample of just 800 people, uh, you can get very accurate results with a margin of error of plus minus 3%, almost irrespective of how large your population is. So if you wanted to know, uh, just as an example, the opinion of uh, all adults in Nevada, of whom there are maybe 2.2 million or so people over 18 in, in Nevada. It's a, it's a rough estimate. That's a lot of people. So uh, all you have to do is to choose 800 people at random. And if you do that, you will get accurate results uh, with a margin of error of plus minus 3% and confidence interval of 95%. And confidence interval means that there's a 95% chance that the margin of error really is within the bounds of 3%, plus or minus, uh, either way. So uh, this is why uh, very, very large samples are extremely, extremely rare, because you, you quickly get to the point of diminishing returns. It rarely makes sense to interview more than uh, 800 people. Also, Whenever you look at public opinion polls, pay attention at the letters that you'll find uh, after the sample size. This is where they typically were uh, one of these letters uh, or set, sets of letters will appear. So the letter A stands for adults, RV stands for registered voters, and LV stands for likely voters. These letters tell you uh, who the sample consists of. So you would take a sample of all adults if you wanted to know the mood of the country overall. So how do people feel about an issue like education or immigration or President Joe Biden or Vice President Kamala Harris? So if you wanted to know the mood of the public, then you would have a sample of adults. But sample of adults would not be very useful if you wanted to predict uh, the outcome of elections. If you wanted to predict the outcome of elections, then you would use LV, which stands for likely voters. And uh, determining who is and is not a likely voter is partly science, partly art, which is why uh, public opinion polls vary sometimes from firm to firm, because they have slightly different methodologies of determining who is and is not a likely voter. Uh, a good aggregate source of public opinion polls is, of course, realclearpolitics.com. I used to be sort of addicted to that uh, website, and you can find all sorts of uh, recent polls from presidential approval rating to how uh, different candidates stand in upcoming elections. And of course, not just current information, but a lot of historical information, which is why uh, the website is so good, because it's so rich with current and historical uh, detail. So uh, when you uh, try to design uh, a survey, a public opinion survey, it's not enough to have random sampling. You also, sh and, and of course, the right sample size. It's also important to get the wording uh, right. So you want to ask questions that are neutrally phrased, and you want to avoid loaded questions. A loaded question is a question that uh, has an answer already built into it, that presumes an answer, that has an assumption or assumptions built into it. So that's, uh, a not, that's not a good way to conduct surveys. You want to avoid loaded questions and pursue only neutral questions. Also, the preferred order of questions should be from simpler to more complex. 
And um, the reason why is because if you ask complex questions right away, there's a greater chance that the interview interviewee will break off uh, the the interview. So uh, if you ask simple questions first that are easy and quick to answer, uh, there you more you're, you're more likely to get answers, and the interviewee is more likely to continue because they will already feel invested into the process. They've answered questions, and psychologically they would want to complete uh, the interview. So try to proceed from uh, simpler questions to complex ones, and not vice versa. Entertainment and abuse uh, in uh, public opinion polls now. Website, radio, and television call-in polls can be fun, and no harm is done so long as the viewers and participants understand the results are not representative of the population in general or even of the listeners slash viewers because the respondents are self-selected. So what happens with all of these polls, be they website, radio, or television call-in, uh, you do not have random sampling. Instead, the sample is self-selected, which uh, does not ensure representativeness. In fact, it ensures virtually the opposite, that the sample is going to be skewed. Uh, as an example, think of a poll that you can take at foxnews.com on one hand and msnbc.com on the other. So people who visit those websites tend to differ ideologically. So when they answer a public opinion poll, the same questions or similar questions are likely to be answered in a very different way. And so results would be different. So while you will get accurate measurements, the, the measurements will not be representative of the overall population. They will be only representative of people who visit those particular websites. And you cannot make generalizations about a group of people or public opinion as a whole based on uh, such uh, obviously ideologically skewed samples. But as long as you understand what's going on, I don't think there's really any harm in uh, participating in those polls. It's, it's, it can be fun, right? But push polls are different because push polls are not entertainment as much as they are abuse. Push polls are designed to influence public opinion under the guise of asking real questions. So instead of trying to persuade you directly, calling you up and telling you to support a particular candidate or oppose a particular candidate, what they will do is they will call you up and they will ask you a question that is loaded and reflects negatively on a particular candidate. So they call you and ask you, would you be more or less likely to support candidate A if you knew that candidate A wants to increase taxes on the middle class by 200%? Okay, so that's a question. But a question like that is trying to implant an idea in your brain, an idea that would induce you to vote in a particular way, i.e. against candidate A. And it's not illegal. It's not defamation. We're not saying candidate A wants to increase taxes on the middle class 10, uh, 200%. We are, saying, we are asking questions, hypothetically. Uh, what if, if conditionally, candidate A, if you knew that this uh, candidate wants to increase taxes 200% on the middle class, whatever middle class means. Uh, so when you build up conditionality and vagueness, into a question, you really sidestep the ir possible issue of defamation. And uh, this is how you try to persuade voters. And if you live long enough, uh, you will eventually uh, encounter a phone call like that, and someone will call you up and will try under the guise of a real poll uh, to do a push poll and influence your opinion. The only way to be sure that you avoid uh, this type of abuse is really not to answer uh, uh, any polls, not to participate in any. Focus groups. Focus groups are used to find out what is relevant to a particular group. 
This group may be important because it is believed to hold the key to winning elections or launching successful marketing campaigns. In politics, this group tends to be the undecided voters. And the reason why is because undecided voters uh, frequently uh, turn election results. They're the ones who determine who will win and uh, who will lose. There are two ways to conduct uh, interviews. There are structured interviews in which the order and the phrasing of the questions are fixed. And there are semi-structured interviews where the moderator may vary the order and the phrasing of the questions. So in the first instance, structured interviews, the moderator doesn't deviate from the order and fr phrasing. In the semi-structured, it's more flexible. The moderator does deviate from the uh, order and uh, phrasing of the questions. Now, the issue of relevance is very important because if you start right away with scientific polling uh, and random sampling, you may get very accurate results, but the results may not be relevant because you don't know which questions to ask. Like if you were to ask uh, students about their education and you ask them questions about uh, their professors, uh, the scheduling of classes, meaning the time of day, uh, the condition of various facilities like the classrooms, computer labs, and libraries. And you could get very accurate answers. And those answers might tell you some useful information. The problem is they might not tell you a lot of useful information because you didn't know to ask for it. So a lot of useful information may go under the radar. For example, Students may be very concerned about the cost of textbooks, but you as a researcher wouldn't know it because you didn't ask about the cost of textbooks. This is where focus groups come in because during focus groups, you can have a more or less uh, open discussion. And that allows you to tease out what really matters to a group of people in front of you. So in politics, you would get a group of undecided voters in a room and you would ask them questions about issues or about candidates. More often than not, it's about candidates. You would ask them to react to candidate statements, etc. Uh, and from there, you can actually de design a uh, well-informed scientific survey uh, which asks closed-ended questions that can be coded into computer, yes or no, support, do not support, intensity of support, all that stuff, because now you have determined what is relevant. So uh, focus groups actually originated in uh, market research in the, world of biz in the world of business, and then uh, political consultants have adopted them for political uses. So I hope you found this useful. And uh, thank you very much for uh, viewing this presentation.